This video is going to explore structural forms and really how they relate to load paths and try to connect it to what you've already learned um, through your experience learning about uh, statics and uh, analyzing simple systems. And the hope for this is to see how you can connect the statics and the simple systems and how we analyze these structures uh, with how they're built and uh, now, it's sort of, you know, make that link between the physical construction of, uh, of structures and uh, how we analyze them. So, as we go through here, I think uh, it's always good to sort of think about, you know, what, what structures are about as simple as we can get. And so, uh, with that, I want to say, well, you know, what is the you know, sort of simplest habitation you can think of? Um... And, and if I were to really boil it down, I'd say it'd be a cave. Um, you know, this is humans and, and other creatures, so bears, uh, will live in caves. And uh, they're good because they keep you out of the weather. They're strong. They're sheltered. Um, and so I guess the question is, how does a cave work structurally? Uh, we always think of it as a, a hole in a mountainside or, or into the ground. Uh, but what's really happening? Well... If you think about it, there's uh, the weight of the uh, of the rock above, and it's really pushing down, and then it has to somehow spread its way around uh, the cave opening, uh, and to you know get back to the ground, and so uh, you know that's uh, that's that's the essential of what's going on, and, and so we're talking about caves, but you know uh, probably closest to caves in terms of structures and are sort of a, a man-made cave, if you would, are tunnels where it's, you know, we're doing the same thing where uh, we're boring a hole into the rock and um, on the left we've got a unlined tunnel there, it's a Homer tunnel down in uh, Fjordland in New Zealand and then on the right we have a line tunnel and, you know, whether we uh, line or unline a tunnel is really due to sort of how strong the rock is and its tendency to want to uh, fall down on us. Uh, but again, we really still haven't figured out you know, what's going on uh, with the tunnel here, a tunnel or a cave. We know that we've got to get this force moving around, but you know what, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. And so with that, <clears throat> what I have on this slide is uh, a schematic of what the force of the ground would be. So you can see it's relatively small at the surface, and then as we keep going deeper and deeper, uh, we keep adding weight of rock, and so the uh, downward force gets larger. So what happens if we put a hole in that? Well, as I said, you know, those forces have to sort of move around this opening um, and to get around to the ground. But, you know, if we're pushing on something, well, it's going to want to try and deform that hole and push it out. And that's going to put the top of that hole in tension, which is why, uh, you know, on some tunnels we will put a lining there. Uh, it's to help deal with that tension force and to keep the, uh, the top of the opening from uh, cracking and breaking out and, and falling down. But what I have drawn here isn't 100% correct because, yes, while... Um, the weight of the rock above is going to want to push that opening into kind of an oval, uh, you have to remember that we also have rock on the sides. And so the sides of the rocks are also going to push in, as well as that uh, force of, uh, you know, the hole trying to deform into an oval pushing out. And this is really that key concept of, it goes back to Newton's third law, where every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And this is true for, for really all structures and really how we're going to analyze these structures, which is that, you know, the external forces acting on them will create internal forces and stresses, and that all has to get balanced with these reactions. <clears throat> so we've been talking about tunnels, and so let's, uh, let's look at this tunnel in 3D. And so we've got this block of material, and we've got this hole in it, and what if I take this sort of, this cut out of this tunnel, uh, this rectangular cut, and then what you see is you get, uh, we're no longer looking at a tunnel, but we're looking at an arch. 
and that's very much what um, you know arches are uh, another structural form which has been around for millennia um, it's uh, it's really efficient and, and it's very simple because it's actually quite similar to a tunnel um, and so let's think about well how does this arch work so this bridge is, uh, is is in New England in the US and it's a dry stack stone bridge so it has no mortar um, so if it has no mortar means that we really have nothing to hold. You know, there's nothing um, which is gluing those stones together, which means that they have to be acting only in compression because if they're acting, if they had tensile forces on them, they would start opening up um, and it would fall out. So, again, thinking about uh, the forces which we have, we've got the forces pushing down, and then those forces have to eventually... Uh, make their way to the ground to where you've got reactions. Now, what I've drawn here, I've drawn the reactions vertically and horizontally because that's uh, that's how we tend to analyze things. Uh, we'll put, we'll break vectors into a Cartesian coordinate system uh, because it's convenient for us, uh, really, and that um, you know instead of having to deal with vectors at different angles. But if you really think about it, all of those forces, the internal forces in the arch uh, and the reactions, all kind of happen at this line of thrust. And this uh, going back and forth between um, these Cartesian coordinates and this sort of line of thrust, uh, we'll explore more later in the semester when we're looking at more circle and stress transformation. And so, just continuing on with our arches, as you can see, uh, Porto Guard, uh, the Roman aqueducts in France. Uh, again, it's a similar uh, element, uh, you know, similar form. Now, the things to sort of uh, take away from this image is you can see that we've got these arches on the top, relatively small, spaced. Um, it's essentially like a distributed load onto the arch below, the larger arch. And then you can see the arch below that, uh, the columns of that arch are lined up so we get, again, uh, sort of collecting that load path down to the ground. If we look at a uh, view of the same aqueduct from above, you can see that um, the uh, middle tier of arches in that aqueduct are wider, and then the bottom ones are wider yet. I mean, what that is doing is at, we're trying to reduce the bearing stress. So uh, the axial stress of an element is just going to be the axial force on the element divided by the area. Um, materials will have a maximum uh, stress which they can take, and so as the forces get bigger, to keep the stress the same, we need to get a larger and larger area. And that's exactly what's going on here, where you can see um, the top row of arches um, r relatively small compared to the other two, and then as we go down, they get larger and larger. And so, but, you know, we keep talking about arches, and we've got the, the Grafton Bridge here in Auckland. Um, why are they that shape? So we, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, forces have to go down onto the arch, and then uh, I've drawn sort of the, the internal force of the arch and compression sort of pushing that back up. But, but why is it this round shape? We, we have this intuitive feeling that it's that direction uh, or that shape just because it's that's efficient but you know oh why is it a, a parabolic and not circular or not triangular well um a, a good way to think about this is really to think about again the internal actions and let's think about it relative to a to a beam so for for bridge structures for the aqueducts which i showed um they're predominant loading on them is going to be their own self-weight. So for a big bridge like this, uh, the cars and the people which will be going on will add some load to it, but uh, for when we get to these large spans, it's mostly the weight of the bridge, which is uh, the bridge has to hold up. And so, um, you know, that weight of the bridge is going to be uniform uh, across uh, the entire bridge. So we can think about this as a uniformly distributed load with a beam. Well, um, what I have drawn down below is the uh, bending moment diagram. Uh, 
where you can see it's got M max at the base of, uh, and that M max would be WL squared over A, where W is the uh, magnitude of the uniformly distributed load. L is the um, length of the member. And just below that M max, I've drawn the um, bending stress diagram. Now, we haven't uh, talked about bending stress yet, but um, well, I've got the formula for it over there. Um, it is simply the uh, magnitude of the moment at that location uh, multiplied by um, y over i, and y over i are um, geometric properties of the section. So y is the distance uh, of the fiber which you're looking at for stress uh, to the neutral axis. And then I is the moment of inertia. And you can think of the moment of inertia as a, um, essentially, it's resistance to bending. And so how much uh, material is away from the neutral axis. And we'll talk about these concepts in more detail. But um, as you can see for a, if you have a prismatic section, so if it's just, say, a uniform rectangle, your bending stress will follow uh, proportionate to your max um, to your maximum bending moment. Now, if we wanted to try to even out this bending stress and reduce it across the length of the member, because you can see by the supports, uh, it's pretty small. So what would we do to reduce the bending stress? We can't do anything to reduce the bending moment unless we take load off. But we can change the bending stress. So one way to do it is just simply make the element um, thicker, uh, where we've got more stress. And you know, if we were smart, we could make it thicker in proportion to the bending moment diagram. And then if we did that, we would see that we would slowly be uh, transitioning down our bending uh, stress to something which is more uniform uh, across the element. So you know, we, this example, we just simply thickened up the beam on the, um, as we, you know, came along towards the middle of the length. Well, what if we flipped it around? We could do the same. And then what if we took out some material? And then, you know, we're ending up with pretty much the same uh, bending stress where as we get to the middle of the material, if you, if you take a free body diagram cut there, well, you've got a moment, you've got a shear, you've got a uh, axial force, and you'll find that you know the uh, the moment or the result moment between the support and the axial force is what's going to help you uh, as you you know make that taller and taller. Well, that's going to reduce that internal shear force um, and that internal uh, bending uh, axial force on there uh, to help take care of that bending moment. So. That's really why arches are, are the shape they are. You'll see if they've got a uniformly distributed load, uh, they're going to be parabolic because it's uh, essentially trying to match that bending moment diagram. And we call this um, phenomenon a, a catenary. And it, it's not, you know, we've been talking a lot about arches. It's not only for arches. It's not only for gravity load. So uh, a very famous case for where we have this is the Eiffel Tower in Paris, where, uh, yes, it's got gravity load that it's trying to support, but, you know, loads don't only come from, uh, from gravity and from weight. They can also come from earthquakes. They can come from wind. And um, the uh, Eiffel Tower has really been optimized for wind. If you, th if you look at it, it's kind of, uh, you know, obviously it's got the arches uh, down at the base, which you can, you can walk through. But if you look at the side profile, well, that looks, you know, vaguely arch-like. So why is it curved like this? Well, if we um, simplify this analysis as a, a simple cantilever with a uniform load pushing sideways on it, well, the shear force diagram is going to be uh, linear, and the bending moment diagram is going to be quadratic. And you can see the shape of that bending moment diagram approximately matches one half of the Eiffel Tower. And then if you think that, you know, wind can blow from uh, one, either direction, well, then it would make sense to, to have sort of that shape. And um, if you look at bridges by Gustav Eiffel uh, prior to when he built the Eiffel Tower, you'll see they have this similar shape. And again, uh, 
Uh, with a bridge, we have the, it's just like having the arch action. Uh, we're trying to uh, re you know, follow the bending moment diagram uh, with the tower uh, as kind of a bridge um, to the sky, if you would. Now, this idea of trying to follow uh, what the loads are um, and then put material where we've got the highest loads or um, move material away from sort of the axis by which it bends around um, is also seen in, a, in another sort of famous case. So this is um, a 19th century analytical model for a church called La Sagrada Familia. Uh, the church is in Barcelona. The um, architect and engineer was um, Antonio Gaudí. Uh, and what he's doing here is, you know, this is a, a stone church. Uh, he wants to keep everything in compression. So he's going to use this idea of catenary where he's trying to follow a bending moment diagram, or in this case, he's trying to um, find out, you know, if he's, you know, if he, if he hangs a bunch of weights of an element in tension, well, that uh, element, you know, for, if you say you had a, a beam and you had a point load on it, well, the bending moment diagram will be a, uh, a, a straight line. Um, same thing, too, if you have a cable and you hold a weight, well, the bending moment diagram is a straight line. The catenary of that cable is uh, is sort of a, a V-shaped. And that's what you're seeing here, where anything that's in tension, well, when you flip it over, you know it's going to be in compression. And so you can see on the image on the right, they've uh, essentially taken um, uh, the, the model. So a picture of the analytical model where he's hanging sandbags around to try to simulate uh, the equivalent weight that the structure would have to have and make sure that his openings are the right shape. Um, they've taken that picture and they've put it uh, underneath the uh, physical model here to sort of show you that the whole idea is to try to mirror it. And then you can see the, you know, sort of the pseudo finished project. So the, the building is still getting built. Uh, it's one of the, it's one of the longest current uh, construction projects in the world. It's um, over 135 years of being constructed at this stage. And, uh, but you can see the, you know, these concepts which, you know, were first brought up into the, the 1800s before we had any computers. We had very complicated structures here, a very, very complicated structure. But this idea of, you know, we can, uh, we can find out, well, what shape does the structure want to be in order to be efficient and then take advantage of the fact that if we're uh, hanging stuff in tension, if you flip it around, uh, what was uh, purely in tension is now purely in compression. And this idea of, you know, keeping things in, in pure tension and following the bending moment diagram, uh, we showed a little bit on, you know, how cables can show that with the analytical model for La Sagrada Familia. Uh, same thing, too, with bridges. So this is the Golden Gate Bridge in um, San Francisco in California. And you can see that it's got, it's a suspension bridge. And the, uh, the drape of the suspended cable looks very similar to what you would have as a bending moment diagram. So we're doing the same thing. So you can think about arches and cables are simply the mirrors of each other, where what they're trying to do, particularly when we're holding uh, these big distributed loads, is get themselves into a shape um, which will match the bending moment diagram so that um, you can, you, you've got a, a large uh, moment to resist the, uh, the applied moment there. So uh, the moment in this case would be between the deck and the top of the towers where uh, that cable is anchored. Now this is a suspended uh, suspension cable uh, suspension bridge, so the cable is dropped in a uh, in a parabolic shape. Um, but cables don't have to be that. So this is a cable stay bridge, and as you can see, the cables here are going to come up in a straight line um, all the way up to the pylon. And what those are doing is they're just providing a point of restraint uh, for the bridge deck, and they're essentially uh, acting like. Uh, little rollers at, at each of those positions where um, they're, they can bring that, uh, that force back up into the pylon. And you don't have to go out and 
and see expensive bridges to see this phenomenon. Uh, if you walk around, so this is in downtown Auckland, uh, the Mercury Theater on Mercury Lane, uh, you can see the same sort of thing at the street awnings, where uh, really, you know, we've got a small analytical model up the top here. Uh, this is like a simply supported beam, but we have uh, the cable, or in the case of, um, of these structures, this cable is uh, a tie rod, which can get adjusted, but it's, you know, it behaves uh, exactly the same. So that's, you know, that's a nice overview of cables and trusses, uh, cables and arches, but what about trusses? So you've learned about trusses already uh, in statics. You've learned how to analyze them with method of joints, method of sections. Why do we bring trusses um, in right after arches and cables? Well, remember the, the dry stack stone arch, everything's in compression. For a cable, you can't push on a rope without it buckling, so everything's in tension. So trusses follow that same thing, that same uh, general pattern where um, the members are either acting in pure tension or pure compression. And so what that means is that um, when uh, an element has to only work with axial force, it can be relatively small. And that's important for some of these large structures where we don't want to use that much material because material adds weight. Um, and so... This is the Makahini Viaduct in the lower North Island of New Zealand. Uh, it's a very tall railway viaduct, and you can see it's just a, a, a great big truss structure. Um, so there's not a lot of material there, but you can see just how deep that truss gets because, you know, you can see the, uh, the electrified power poles up there for scale. Uh, you know, these, the, the truss is as deep, as, as deep, if not deeper, than those power poles. And that's, you know... It helps you get a you know, the the bending moment between the top cord of the truss and the bottom cord of the truss. Say if we were to take a, a free body diagram cut in the middle, well, you know that tension and compression force is what's going to help um, restrain that bending moment. So it's the same thing as an arch. You know the arch is just trying to push material away um, from the uh, reaction so that you know, you get a larger force couple. Um, so as I said, their trusses are are used for these big structures because they're efficient and we don't want to put a lot of weight there. They're also efficient with materials for when you don't have a, uh, a very large structure, um, but you want to save materials. So uh, this is the Gates of Haas down in the South Island. Um, it was built in the uh, you know 1930s. You can see the riveted connections. And so this was a time where, uh, while this would have been a very labor-intensive um, bridge to build, the problem you know, at the time was not uh, a shortage of labor. It was during the Great Depression. There were a lot of people looking for work, um, but materials were very expensive. Uh, it was a time in New Zealand where it was, uh, materials had to come on a boat from Europe uh, several months, so you wanted to use as little as possible and have your structure as efficient as possible. And so that's, you know, trusses give you that really efficient structure because they're only working uh, along their axis and we're not asking them to do any bending. Um, another place where you can see trusses and where this efficiency is helpful is in roof trusses. Um, so these come along with, um, you know, in housing for uh, light timber framing. Uh, previously, uh, before trusses gained popularity, you would use rafters, so you'd have to use these very large, um, you know, pieces of dimensional timber. And so not only is that kind of hard to find uh, more and more because they're cutting trees down at a faster rate, so you don't have large uh, sort of, you know, 2 by 12, 2 by 16 elements, 4 by 18 elements, so big chunky pieces of timber, which you see in really old houses, uh, those are harder to come by. Um, but, you know, if you can use, and it, yeah, they're harder to come by because you need a, a portion of the tree, which is... Uh, going to be uh, good uh, timber throughout that whole ge geometry. Well, if you have a truss, you can get away with smaller members. So these are uh, two by four members, which are gang nailed together. And there's lots of two by fours in a, in a tree cross section. And so it's easier to get uh, good timber for that. Also, as you can see, uh, this can all just get handled by, by people. You don't need large machines or anything else because the truss is very light because it uses very little material. And then that will still, but it will still allow you to span uh, 
um, quite reasonable distance. So uh, we've been talking about trusses really with uh, gravity load, but there's nothing to say uh, that we can't turn the building on its side. So just like when we looked at the Eiffel Tower, um, these factors uh, which are driving structural form are the same for both gravity and for lateral. And so what a brace frame is, is trying to keep a building from racking over and falling over sideways. And it just acts exactly like a truss. And so here's an example for you of a uh, building down at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, where um, you've got a brace frame. These happen to be buckling restrained brace frames, but it's, it's the same notion where um, these are really there not to keep uh, loads uh, spanning from a you know, building sideways, but to keep them from getting pushed over, keeping the building from getting pushed over sideways. So uh, a few examples of trusses there. Let's take a bit of a deep dive into you know how they work, and then this might uh, provide us some insights to uh, you know maybe how some other structures work. So uh, here's we have some generic truss with some vertical load. Uh, it's on a, some simple supports. And then if we were to analyze this truss and look at what the internal forces are, we would see that for uh, sort of this simple, you know, uh, gravity truss, the top cord will be in compression and the bottom cord will be in tension. And then the web members there will, um, you know, oscillate between tension and compression depending upon where they are. So why do we look at this in, in any detail? I mean, this is one, it's useful to know this so that when you're looking at a truss and you're analyzing it, you gain this intuition that, well, the top is going to be in compression because it's going to get pushed uh, together, and that bottom wants to get pulled apart as we put that load on. So it's going to stretch, and the web will go um, up and down. Um, the other thing that you can notice is that, well, the, the web member here in the middle has no arrow. It's because it's a zero-force member, and then as you get uh, further out to the edge... Uh, if you were to analyze this, you would see that the forces in your web members go up, and when you're in the middle of the span, the forces in your top and bottom cord are, are largest. And so that's kind of your bending forces are largest uh, sort of towards the, uh, towards the middle, and your shear as you get towards the supports. But we can use this concept of a truss to really understand, you know, how does a beam work? And how does the internal forces of a beam work? And so this is what we call a strut and tie analogy. Um, it's used a lot in reinforced concrete, where uh, this helps you uh, design not a, your, your reinforcement layout. But it's also helpful just as a, a, a first primer of how a beam is working. It's really, if you feel comfortable with a truss, a beam is doing much the same thing, where um, the, as we bend the beam with this you know, gravity load pointing down, we're going to put the top into compression, and that top is going to get shorter. And the bottom will be in tension, and the bottom will get longer. And so that manifests itself. So say we were to take a free body diagram cut uh, through this beam, uh, what we would see is uh, these bending stresses, where, again, the top is in uh, tension, uh, top is in compression, bottom is in tension for the loading, which we just showed. And that's because there's an internal moment uh, and internal shear. So the stresses that I'm showing here are only for bending. I haven't shown the shear stresses um, yet, and I won't in this presentation. But a, a, a thing to note is that, you know, as you get closer to the edges, your bending stresses get bigger. The other thing to note is that your bending stresses, you can see that they all break down into um, essentially a tiny a, a summation of, of axial stresses. So just like a truss, uh, beams are behaving in a very similar way. And then there's a mid, and there's a point there in the middle, um, which is what we call the neutral axis, where we have no bending uh, stress. And that's because the beam hasn't gotten uh, longer or shorter there, so we haven't strained it, and so we don't have any stress. And so that's, uh, that's how beams work. Uh, they work you know, analogous to a truss, um, but because you've got a continuous amount of material, you can sort of change that stress. So where do we see these beams and sort of what form do they take? Because we've been doing lots of analysis of, you know, we see a, a triangle for a pin and a circle for a roller, but where do they where do they occur? Well, some very ancient structures. So here's Stonehenge. Uh, 
uh, you can see the, um, the, the capping stones there. So these are really just uh, beams, and this is what we'll call sort of post and beam construction or, or a simple frame. And if you look at those beams, while well, there's a separation, they're just sitting on top. So we could analyze them just like a uh, simply supported beam. So that's, that's, that's beams, and we're, we're getting more and more comfortable with those, and you can you now have some practice analyzing, well, what are the internal forces? So the uh, shear forces, the bending moment diagrams, and the, uh, the axial forces. And I uh, showed you in the previous section, you know, how uh, would you find the bending stresses there? And what do they look like? So that's the, the, the beam part of this post and beam uh, seems to make some sense. But what about the, the stones which are holding up the beams, uh, these columns? So what are the things that we need to know about columns? Well, with columns, again, everything's driven by how do they want to fail. So there's two main modes of failure for columns. The first one, which I've shown here, is buckling, where if you push on an element... Uh, it wants to bend out sideways and collapse. And um, this is why you, you can't push on a rope because the rope wants to buckle. So buckling is really driven by uh, the load, the end conditions, which you can see in the Euler buckling model um, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, and the geometry of the section. So it's what we, we call slenderness. So slenderness is a, a ratio of how long the column is, or it could be abrasive, the, how long the element which is in compression is um, over uh, the area which it is. So uh, long, skinny elements are really want to buckle, and short, stocky elements um, have a, a greater resistance to buckling. And you can get short enough and stocky enough that you don't buckle, but you squash. And so here are some examples of squashing. One is the Mission Gothic undercrossing, which um, that concrete column uh, squashed down. It failed in axial compression um, during the uh, Northridge earthquake. And then we've got some short uh, steel sections uh, here, which you can also see squashing. Now, for both of these, and then we'll talk about the steel sections uh, probably, in, we'll use that as our example if that same cross-section were longer, it would hit a point where it wouldn't squash anymore, but it would buckle. So that's the thing to remember with columns. It's all about slenderness, so the ratio of length over area. And so if we look back at Stonehenge, well, those columns are, you know, if we highlight them up here, they're pretty short and stocky. Um, I don't think that, and they've got a relatively light load compared to what they're holding up themselves. Um, unlikely that they're going to be, uh, you know, squashing or buckling or anything else. And so it's not a terribly efficient structure. It, it's an impressive one, but it, it's not structurally efficient. So um, this is with frames. Eh, we, we use them because, well, the columns are, they have to deal with a bit of bending, but, uh, you know, so more than, say, a truss member, so they're stockier than that. But, you know, they're, they're still quite an efficient structure, and they... Um, you know, help us get sort of spanning over distances. And if we were to analyze uh, the structure here where the big lantern is in Tokyo, um, you know, this would be what our frame uh, structure would look like, something along this lines. And now all of a sudden we've gone from a structure which uh, we would see out in the world to now we can start to think about it uh, you know, how we'd be analyzing uh, structures in this course and in your statics course and in subsequent uh, structural engineering courses. And so, you know, this is the analytical model of that pagoda for, uh, you know, one frame line. Obviously, uh, there are multiple frame lines because it's a 3D structure, not 2D. But, you know, we can use the same concept to analyze multi-story buildings. And it's this uh, breaking things down into these frames, and then, you know, what does it look like, that we, uh, is really the essence of structural engineering, where we take a physical structure, and then we bring it into a, uh, an analytical model, which we can solve either using, uh, you know, hand equations or with uh, computer analysis. So, uh, last few things I want to talk about, we've talked a lot about gravity loads, 
Uh, we talk about frames and trusses and arches and cables. Uh, sort of within frames, because most buildings um, have some form of frame structure to them. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about some different classes of structures and really how they relate to lateral loads. So, as I said with the Eiffel Tower, you know, loads don't only go straight down. Uh, they go to the side too, and those side loads will come either from, um, you know, typically from wind or from uh, seismic forces. And so, for lateral loads, uh, we will classify buildings based upon, you know, the method that they have to resist. So, uh, one of the classic ones are a, a moment frame or a moment resistant frame building. And for this type of building, um, all of those connections are fixed connections. Every connection can take, can restrain a moment. And with that, uh, that means that, you know, it's going to resist lateral forces um, through bending of both the beams and the columns. And so uh, what's good about this structural form is it's quite open. So architects really like it because, um, you know, you put big windows in, you can do lots of flow around uh, the structure that's not impeded by uh, walls or braces. Um, but the problem with it is it's very flexible. So this flexibility uh, can be good for the structure because, you know, it can go through large deformations without breaking. But it might be really challenging to get your, your glazing system, so the building envelope around it, or if you've got um, drywall partition walls, uh, those are quite stiff and they'll break. So uh, it's always this trade-off between, you know, how the building is going to deal with uh, the lateral loads and keep the structure fine uh, versus how it's going to keep the uh, the non-structural components. Because the building is more than just the structure, it's this whole building. So that's a moment-resisting frame. As we go to something slightly stiffer, uh, is a braced frame building. So I showed you uh, an image of a braced frame, so for buckling restrained braces. And you can think of a braced frame as essentially a, a truss uh, which is going vertically. So it, it's analyzed the same way. Um, and we use the rest of the floors as uh, what we call collector elements to take the loads into that truss. And so uh, what the, the rest of the building, uh, the floor plates will be nominally, tend to be nominally pinned. And with that nominally pinned, uh, it means that we're not going to have to resist moment there. So those elements can be a bit smaller. And we're going to bring all of that lateral force into the braces. And so then we would have to design the brace for uh, axial forces it's going to see, so primarily tension. And then make sure that it doesn't buckle uh, when it, uh, the load reverses and it goes into compression. And so brace phrases, braced frames are, um, they're, they're stiffer than moment frames. But, you know, you've got a, a, a very big brace there. And again, you've got to, um, you got to worry about them in terms of, you know, you have to design for the buckling of those braces um, and, and the like. So uh, really good, used a lot in steel construction. And sort of the third general um, term that we have are, are sort of these wall buildings where uh, this is by far the stiffest and you can if you look at it so just like the braced frame building was essentially a truss on its side a wall building is essentially a beam uh, going vertically um, so cantilevering up and so uh, most of it is going to be the stiffest element of that um, structure and so it's going to attract all of that load and it's the stiffness of the wall uh, which is keeping the building uh, from deflecting much, and so wall buildings tend to be much stiffer, uh, so uh, elements which are going to be sensitive to uh, deformation or deformation between stories, which we call drift, um, tend to do better in wall buildings. Now I have these as, you know, different buildings, but you could easily have a moment, uh, a building which has a moment frame in one direction and a brace frame in the other, or a brace frame in one direction and a wall in the other, or wall and wall, or brace and brace, as a, as a designer, you can mix and match these to whatever project, uh, whatever the project requires and whatever makes the most sense. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the beauties of structural engineering is, is your ability to um, take all of these different solutions and, and apply them as needed. So the last thing I want to talk about is because we've been talking about, you know, moment frames, brace frames. I said with moment frames, you're going to resist 
the connections will resist moments, the brace frames, they won't. Um, let's talk about connections, which is sort of the last bit of structural form, is we've got these forms, but we got to make sure that the connections behave the way that we think. And so this is, these are, we'll start with the base connections because this is what you've learned so far in statics where you've got a fixed connection where it can resist uh, translation in two directions and uh, and a moment, a pin, where you can resist translation in two directions and a roller. And obviously we're talking about 2D here, but the same um, aspects apply to three dimensions. So, but what does a fixed connection look like out in the world? Um, you know, you can, it's easy to draw uh, this fixed connection on a piece of paper, but then you need to, as a designer, if you want your building to behave that way, uh, you need to ensure that the uh, the connection which you use there has sufficient uh, rotational stiffness so that it, it can take the moment. So, uh, oftentimes, uh, fixed connections are concrete. So this is the bottom of a uh, concrete column at a bridge, and, uh, you know, Concrete, concrete, concrete connections are almost always fixed. Those are very stiff um, in the uh, rotational direction. Um, the other thing you know you could have, you could have them out of steel. So, but you know if you do them without out of steel, that connection has to be a lot stiffer in rotation uh, than the element is itself. So you can see for this steel element, um, the steel base connection, it's got these gusset plates and these stiffeners and we've pushed the bolts out very far, and the base plate is very thick. So it's a really beefy, chunky connection, um, and that's how we can get you know a fixed connection out of steel uh, at the base. So pin connections, you know, sometimes they can be just true pins. So this one uh, is a true pin with a timber element attached, but I've, I've seen these with uh, steel elements, and sometimes this is an architectural choice, sometimes this is for, uh, you know, a if you've got propping or anything else. Um, but you know, sometimes you can get a pin which is a, a true pin where it can rotate freely and it can't translate. More often what you'll get, and you know, often in timber construction, you'll get a pin which is simply because the connection uh, to the uh, timber is uh, often these sort of uh, heavy gauge but uh, still sheet metal connections which that sheet metal connection, if you're bending it out of plane, I mean, you can bend it with your hands. It might be, you know, might be some effort, but you can bend it with your hands. You can't bend this four by four with your hands. And so the rotational stiffness of uh, that base is uh, much smaller than what the rotational stiffness of the element is. And so we would analyze this as pinned. Similarly too, if we have a steel connection. So look at the difference between the two steel connections that we have here. So the fixed one, lots of gusset plates, very thick base plate, uh, lots of bolts um, outside, you know, is to, to create as much uh, resistance to moment as we can. And then our nominally pinned steel connection, no gusset plates, uh, reasonably thin base plate. And so it's really the this connection is only going to be... Um, it's relying upon the rotation of this base plate, which is, this, you know, maybe a 16, maybe a 20 millimeter thick plate relative to the uh, 300 millimeter thick, um, you know, steel beam there. That steel beam, oh, sorry, the steel column has a lot more rotational resistance than this base plate. And that's, again, that's how we design these pinned uh, versus um, fixed. So, you know, we're going to take this down into an analytical model or a, or a computational model in a computer to pin, but then we have to make sure that we detail this so that it does act pinned. And then finally, a roller. So sometimes, and these are often found in bridges uh, to allow for expansion of these bridges um, as you you go through heating cycles through the day. Um, so sometimes there are these pure pins where uh, literally can just roll back and forth. Um, and this one doesn't have any tie downs, but you know some of them they'll have pins and they'll have tie downs which are in slots so that the bridge doesn't bounce off in an earthquake. Um, other times they'll have these elastomeric bearings uh, which are just these big rubber bearings which allow for the same uh, movement side to side. So that's at the base connections and now the last sort of connections we want to look at are when we have internal connections sort of say within a frame. 
And um, so what I've drawn here, I've got them as you know beams and then sort of you know a, a beam column joint, if you would. And so I draw them as beams because oftentimes in a frame we'll break up um, you know beams into or columns into individual members and we'll analyze them. We want to be able to analyze these for design purposes because as you'll find design is a very iterative process. Uh, we want to break them down into sort of simple representations. So we might take a frame uh, which has fixed connections at both ends and then we'll just analyze it like this beam here on the left where it's just a beam uh, with two fixed connections. And similarly too, uh, we might do something for if we've got pinned ends. So looking at internal connections for, you know, what's a fixed internal connection? Well, again, our, our friend Concrete, um, big and stiff and, and monolithic and cast. Um, typically, your concrete connections for concrete, which is cast on site, will be, um, will be fixed. Uh, you can get stuff where you've got some uh, precast concrete where things are pinned around, but generally, as a, as a rule of thumb, um, concrete connections, are you, you can analyze them as fixed. Uh, similar to steel connections, if only if you have the flanges, so the top and bottom, only if those are connected through to uh, the column will this be a fixed connection. Because the flanges, if you remember back to the um, you know, where we showed the bending stresses, that's where our bending stress is biggest. And so uh, we would need to connect those through in order to be able to resist that at a moment connection. And then you can also get a moment connection in timber. You tend to need to do this with heavy timber. It'd be these very, very large, stiff um, gusset plates where you can see on the ends of this truss um, that, you know, that would be, if you think about, you know, take moments at the bottom corner, well, each of those bolts has a moment arm and some moment resistance. So you can see where that would be actually a quite stiff connection. And again, all of this is the relative... Uh, rotational stiffness of the connection uh, versus the element it's connecting in. That's how we decide if something is fixed or pinned. Now for pin connections, um, you know, I've got the heavy timber uh, with the big gusset plates, that's fixed. Most sort of dimensional timber, so for what's used in uh, housing and construction, so these are your, your 4 by 2s and anything which is connected with nails, um, is typically a, we would analyze that as pinned because uh, it can, it's got some rotation, it's got some flexibility, you'll have some nail slip, and so that's, yeah, that we'll, we'll use that as pinned. And then similarly to steel connections, which we do not connect uh, the flanges. So uh, if you compare and contrast the two images here, so the top, you can see the flanges are connected, at the bottom you can see that they're not, and the bottom, the pinned case, um, we've only connected through the web, and so we can transfer shear, uh, but we can't really transfer very much moment through that. So uh, that's my brief rundown on structural forms and how it relates to uh, the analytical models which you have, and uh, give you some examples of you know what do these fixed and pin connections look like in the real world, and you know why are structures uh, sort of shaped the way that they are. But I just want to kind of uh, leave you with this one thought where, you know, as a structural engineer, it's your job to tell the building how to behave. So if you're going to analyze uh, an element which is a, a fixed element, well, then when you actually do the drawings and you design that connection, you have to make sure that it's fixed. Uh, similarly, too, if you are expecting a load path to occur or you need a load path to occur within a building, it's your job to make sure that uh, you can uh, you know, lay out the building and design it such that you can guarantee that load path. And that's, uh, that's where some the art of structural engineering comes in. That's where a lot of the fun happens uh, in this design is, is really making sure that you know, what you've analyzed on paper or on the computer um, can get translated and behave that way in real life. So with that, I wanted to say thank you for watching.